Okay, we just talked about modeling goals. Let's talk about modeling strategies and we will be done with this lecture one on subsurface modeling. So let's just take a quick look at the common subsurface modeling workflow. This is documented within the book Perch and Deutsch, 2014. And these are the distinct steps that we look at when we are building a subsurface model. First, we're going to specify our goals. In doing this, of course, we have to jointly look at what information is available to us. We're going to then develop a conceptual model. We're going to infer statistical parameters. And then we're going to build estimation models in space for each one of the properties of interest. And we do that for a very special purpose. That is, we don't want heterogeneity to interfere with our ability to see what's going on in the area or volume of interest. And so by keeping it very simple, looking at just estimation models, you can often track down, debug, see all kinds of issues. You can see general trends and behaviors. We know we're going to simulate, but let's go ahead and still do estimation as a good way to understand the subsurface. We'll build simulation models. We'll build multiple realizations and scenarios. And we're going to post-process those models. That will also include the use of a transfer function to understand the forecast, volumetrics, flow rates, whatever it might be. Let's also look at the data integration workflow. So we are going to integrate a variety of different data sources. Subsurface modeling is an integration game. And so we'll have core and well log data. We'll have our seismic data, our well test and production data. We got all of the geologic conceptual information based on experience, based on analogous fields and data sets and so forth. We're going to put that all together. We're going to develop a consistent sequence of events that describes the formation of this reservoir, the story of the reservoir. This story is essential to understanding overall kind of the framework of the reservoir, but also in making predictions away from the data. It's consistent. We're going to establish the stratigraphic layering. We're going to subset this into distinct units, and regions, We'll go ahead and do facies modeling, where we're modeling discrete categorical properties that describe different unique units of the rock as far as uh, is it sandstone, is it shale, is it dolomite, is it limestone, is it deep water channel, is it deep water fan or lobe or sheet. And so these categories are essential to understanding the reservoir plumbing. In fact, I'll say it many times, often in my experience, 80%, 90% of heterogeneity was described by facies modeling. Porosity and permeability then constrained by the facies. And if we do it like that, we now have a model of all the properties of interest that we would, when we include saturations too, in order to make forecasts in order to support decision making with regard to development. So this is the typical data integration workflow for the case of reservoir subsurface modeling. Let's talk about some general strategies, how reservoir modeling projects are put together. One of the first strategies is the concept of fit for purpose modeling. This is the idea that when we design the model and the modeling workflow, we are simultaneously considering the goals of the model. We're thinking forward to how this model is going to be used. Now, it's not a bad idea if we're doing fit for purpose to also put a little bit of extrapolation with regard to how the model could be used. We may find that the model is used for overall volumetrics, but at some point there might be an interest in understanding recovery factor connectivity, we might want to include a bit more detail to support that possible and common use case for the model. In addition, 
as we're designing the modeling workflow, we would want to also be accounting for the resources that are available. In every organization, the resources are limited. They're a precious asset of the organization. Time, computational and professional time, people. Who are the people who can be allocated to the project? The people's expertise. What are their knowledge base? What do they know? What do they not know? What are their capabilities? All of this controls the amount of time we spend on modeling, the complexity in the modeling, and so forth. It makes no sense at all to design a workflow that's too complicated for the people involved, and then we're not competent, or the model we're not confident in the modeling result. And so we can go back to this commonly expressed figure right here when it comes to project management, where we can talk about the competing aspects of a project outcome, good, cheap, and fast. And the common saying is that we can only pick two. You can have good and cheap, but then it's going to be slow and good. You can have good and fast, but it's going to be expensive. You can have fast and cheap. That's just low quality. And if you ask for all three, you typically, typically cannot have that. Okay, so what are the modeling constraints when it comes to putting together a modeling workflow? Well, professional time. How much time of specific professionals with specific knowledge or skills to work on the project. You may find that you have experts in certain fields that can help you with the project, but they can only dedicate a certain fraction of their time. You would want to manage all of that and that will constrain your project. Organizational capability. What are the skills of the people that you have available to you? They may not all be theoreticians. You may not want to develop your own brand new methodologies. You may want to take things that are a little bit, a little bit well trodden, proven workflows, given the fact that maybe your workforce is not experienced. Or if you have an experienced workforce, you might want to try out something new. You might want to see if you can take your modeling to the next level. That's fine. Computational facilities, the hardware and the software that's available to the project. It can turn out that the models you want to build at the resolution you want to build them are now billion cell models. Okay, you have to start thinking about the hardware you have available to you. Can your people even load the model into memory? And if they can load it, can they load it in the amount of time that, in a manner that is efficient for them to work with the project, or are you just going to bog down because you're unable to? Maybe your software can't even handle it, even with a lot of hardware resources. Maybe you don't have the most cutting edge subsurface modeling software available to you. Maybe you have something that's a little more canned, not flexible, to allow you to be able to build custom workflows. Total budget. Well, Limiting, this will limit your professional time on the project, the computational resources, the data that can be collected to assist the project and so forth. Every part of the project is constrained by these things. So there's a significant requirement for a prioritization. Okay, modeling constraints. Now let's talk about some strategies in putting together reservoir modeling workflows. The top-down reservoir modeling workflow, as discussed by Williams, and sect in the context of surface-based modeling later. Here's a very nice image from their work from 2009. Is the idea that you start at the most simplest model possible. Big scale, the fundamental features, the big trends, and you model that first. And you look at that first and you, you assess how does that behave? You apply the transfer function to that. And then what you do is you add detail, more and more detail, and you could go down. So you start with this very coarse scale model, uh, perhaps prog prograding clinoforms, pair sequences, and you could go ahead and start to put the information within the individual units here, these inclined units. And then you could look at, well, but within that, there's specific 
forms. These coniforms have additional features. Maybe these are um, specific beds that were formed by individual flow, flows within the um, time of um, deposition. Maybe there's bioturbation. Maybe there's cycles and so forth. And then you could go to smaller and smaller scales. You would go down in scale, add more detail until it doesn't matter. And that's a very general type of idea. Top-down reservoir modeling suggests lots of fast cycling, add detail, testing, a level of empiricism when you're building your modeling workflow. You're learning as you're modeling. It's a really good idea. It allows you to provide very efficient, fast initial assessments and then to refine them as you go forward. And it can provide a lot of information about where you should go to further refine. You can learn the impact of scale and detail with this modeling approach. Now, I mentioned previously I'm a fan of Mark Bentley, his work specifically on modeling for discomfort. Now, he noted in his 2015 paper that models had become, in some cases, a verification tool for decisions already partially or fully made. This is what modeling for comfort is. You're building the model just simply to support what you already know. And this can be a pretty big temptation in mature situations where you have a lot of data available to you. You may feel overconfident. You may feel you already know that the subsurface has no surprises left for you. Well, Bentley suggests is that we should be modeling for discomfort. We should take our current concepts and the, and the current decisions that have been made, and we should stress test them to see under what circumstances we would fail, to see under what circumstances our project would be impacted in a critical manner. We are challenging ourselves to explore the full space of uncertainty and not to anchor on what we already think, what we already learned, and the data that's already available to us, we have to recognize that there's still a lot we have not seen. Well, by doing this, there's, there's two sides to this. One is we may identify remaining upside potential that if we narrowed ourselves too soon, we would not have recognized. But also we can recognize or see worst case scenarios. We can secure ourselves against a potential downside. Now, in doing this, we have to recognize our biases. We have to fight against our tendency towards confirmation bias, which is once the group has established a concept to basically to emphasize information that supports that concept and demote information that contradicts that concept. This, is, this whole approach is enabled, this approach of trying to explore uncertainties and so forth, is enabled from, by moving from, as Bentley advocates a single detailed full field model to multi-scale multiple models. Model parts of the reservoir at different scales according to different questions you're trying to answer. This makes sense. It provides you a certain level of agility and prevents you from being frozen in the state of, boy, updating that big detailed model would sure be costly and difficult to do which could definitely freeze us and prevent us from being able to move in an agile manner and answer those questions, explore those uncertainties. Yeah, I very much like that approach by Mark Bentley. So I will also comment on some of the different types of modeling methods or modeling workflows based on different modeling goals. And so let's just very quickly, we'll cover four of these. For the course, we will be focused on reservoir modeling. But I want to just introduce you to the idea that reservoir modeling is not the only form of subsurface modeling. Even in oil and gas, there's other types of models. Okay, more details on these methodologies are available in the book Perch and Deutsch 2014. So let's talk about, first one would be two-dimensional mapping for volumetrics. And so you'll see this type of work, actually. Um, commonly, it's known as remaining resources is one way it's stated. The goal is to produce a map of the remaining resource in place. So the properties you'd be considering would be in a conventional reservoir, thickness, vertically average porosity, saturation, saturation, 
seismic attributes. The model is you're going to estimate the volume in place between the wells, and you could integrate some physics into it. I'm not suggesting this is just a simple multiplication or summation. So basically what you'll do is with the simple method of oil in place, you just simply take at every single possible column. You can work out the thickness multiplied by the average porosity, multiplied by the average saturation of the fluid of interest, water, oil, gas. And you can figure out for each one of these pixels in 2D, vertically averaged, what is the resource in place. And of course, you can do this over the entire map and get a summation of the entire map over all locations, alpha. Or you can look at a map of that at each location. Why is that valuable? Well, we have wells here. We have an indication of high resource in place here. This may help us make choices about infill drilling or possible opportunities for enhanced recovery and so forth. Regional mapping. We might want to work at the very biggest scales, the very largest scales of modeling. So here's an example right here from our friends up in Alberta, Canada, the Alberta Geologic Survey, uh, Energy Board, and so forth. Um, we have uh, Francis Hine here with a nice paper from 2015 and a model of the bitumen pay thickness for oil sands in northeast Alberta. And so this is over a large chunk of the province. We're dealing with models here in which we have model areas that's thousands of kilometers squared. We have large model cells where the individual model cells are going to be on the order of 10 kilometers or so, tens of kilometers. And this is very valuable. We can understand, start to understand spatial distribution resources to evaluate different lease options, areas, sequencing for development, lay, layout of facilities. Very large scale decision making would be supported by regional mapping. The properties we'll work with would be kind of vertically average type of properties such as thickness, um, producibility index where we try to combine properties together in a way that maximizes the correlation with a production or value type of metric. The so the models are going to be very large and everything here is really going to be two dimensions. Then we can go to the other end of the spectrum. In this case we're dealing with micro and mini models. The goal is to build poor scale models to transfer their influence to the reservoir model for forecasting. How do we impact knowledge? How do we take knowledge about the very small pore scale and use that to impact our knowledge, our uncertainties with regard to reservoir scale, reservoir production? So the properties that we're going to be modeling here are a bit different. They're, they're actual, the rock, the mineral, the pore space is going to be modeled. Maybe different types of cement or something. Okay. So we're working at very small scale grains. In the case of a micro model, you might be modeling over a single core plug. In the case of a mini model, you might sacrifice some resolution in order to model at the scale of an individual reservoir model cell or block. So of course, here's an image from the digital rock portal. My neighbor here at University of Texas at Austin, Masha Pradonovic, our professor Pranovic is in fact uh, working, uh, leading this digital rock portal. And um, I have one of my PhD students, Javier Santos, is in fact working on a project jointly with Dr. Pranovic that deals with very small scale type of modeling. So this is a very valuable, useful form of modeling too, reservoir modeling. Well, this is standard and this is what we're going to talk about in the course, but we want to talk about these other types of modeling methods, or workflows, so we don't leave that out, that we, we recognize that there's more we can do with subsurface modeling. A lot of the concepts are common. Once you know one type, you can definitely apply your knowledge to other types. So in reservoir modeling, the goal is to build a set of inputs for calculations of flow simulation, volumetrics, and so forth, connectivity, and so forth. The properties that we're modeling, the properties of interest are going to include Faces, porosity, permeability, saturations, seismic attributes that have been inverted, 
pressure, production rates, and so forth. The models, they're going to have, usually the area is going to be over tens of kilometers by tens of kilometers, maybe a couple of kilometers, maybe just several kilometers by several kilometers, vertically maybe tens of meters, maybe hundreds of meters vertically. The cell sizes are typically tens of meters in aerial extent, but maybe only a quarter meter or a full meter in vertical extent. Model number of cells might be tens of millions, hundreds of millions, pretty typical. Uh, billion cell models are still kind of rare, kind of a challenge to work with, but of course that's changing all the time. Okay, let's just finish up with just kind of putting this together and talking about the overall reservoir modeling workflow. We're going to integrate all the available information to build multiple scenarios and realizations to sample an uncertainty space. This block right here represents an idea of an uncertainty space. We have multiple scenarios, one, two, and three. They're distinctly different from each other with the modeling choices, but, then, but within each one of these, we have different realizations that account for spatial uncertainty. We will get into more of these details. We apply all the models to the transfer function. The transfer function, volumetric calculations, flow simulation, connectivity analysis, many different types of transfer functions. We assemble a distribution of the outcome, the forecast. This distribution right here, the example would be recovery factor. Then we're able to make a decision on a decision based on this uncertainty distribution of this output or forecast. That's the decision criteria we want to work with. That's the overall modeling workflow. Okay, well I hope this has been a useful discussion. We talked about modeling strategies, we talked about distinctly different modeling workflows, and then we finished up just by summarizing a bit more detail about the reservoir modeling workflow. This concludes lecture number one with four distinct parts. I got feedback that people would like them broken up into smaller lectures, so it's a little more efficient for them to get into them part by part, a little bit more of a buffet style. You can consume what you need to consume at the time. So I hope this was useful. As usual, I am very open to feedback. I am Michael Perch. I am a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I am also the Geostats guy on Twitter. And... Of course, if you're watching this, you know about my YouTube channel. I also have information shared on my personal website, michaelperch.com. And I am happy to discuss any time. All right, take care.